Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever wanted a wish granted? An elegant lady with great means walked into one of these senior care centers, and she said to the nurses, gather around. I want to say something to you. I want to let you know how much I appreciate the way you've been taking care of my aunt. You've been doing a great job. And I'm so pleased with this that I want to offer you uh, the next three wishes. Three wishes? What? This sounds kind of strange. To prove to you, she waved her hand and poof, there was a beautiful array of flowers and lovely drinks and food and appetizers for them to partake of. Wow. She means business. Three wishes. The first one stepped up. Well, well, I'd like to offer my wish. The first nurse says, you know what? I'd like to see myself. I'd like to be on this tropical island. And I'd like to be surrounded by single, good-looking men who are catering to my every need. Poof. She was gone. Well, the next nurse said, well, I'd like to offer my wish. And okay. I'd like to go to this wonderful ski resort, and I would like to be uh, someplace where I would be in this warm cabin, and I also would be surrounded by all these handsome men feeding me, caring for me, taking care of me. Poof, she was gone. And then this elegant woman spoke to the last nurse and said, well, the last wish, what will it be? The last nurse was the charge nurse, and she said, I want those two back on the floor by the end of lunch break. Bam. There's a Bible story where Jesus offers a wish. Not as a magician. It simply responds to the wish of someone. When he turned to them and said, what is it that you wish of me? What is your desire? What desire do you have? What would you like to see unfold within your heart and your life? What's the desire of your heart? This man being a blind man sitting along the road, it was his desire that he might see. Let me tell you this. The Spirit of God is here not as a magic magician, simply asking the same question. What's the desire of your heart? What's your greatest wish? Because let me tell you this, as that desire, as that intention is set, as that is exposed, as that is spoken out or expressed, that desire, that wish, that which is coming within, you, that you so intend and want for your life, God is there to meet that need. God wants to know, what is it you wish for today? Because let me tell you this, there are many of us who might say, well, I'd like to wish for great fame, or you too want to be on that tropical island having handsome men taking care of you. Or you may be one who says, I want fame, I want success, I want notoriety, I want wealth, whatever it may be. But to tell you the truth, the greatest wish of all in our heart and our life and in our journey on this earth is the wish to see, to see. Oh, I'm not talking about sight in the sense of a physical realm, being able to see the mountains, the beaches, to see beautiful views or artwork, to see beautiful people or the wonderful nature around us. I'm talking about the ability to see the real heart of God to see the infinite possibilities of the divine that are available to us, to see and to understand, for to understand is to see and to see is to truly understand all that God has for us. But too often we are living in a world of blindness, blind to the spiritual possibilities that await us each and every day. When you woke up today, was your, were your eyes on all the infinite possibilities of God? Today, God is going to do something amazing in my life. Today, God is going to unfold uh, miraculous miracles for me. Today, I'm going to be walking in wonderful success and prosperity and the divine health and wholeness that God intends for me. Were you seeing that? Was that in your mind's eye? Do you understand that the power and presence of God is ready to unfold for us amazing blessings and goodness? We sometimes miss the very point of this journey and this life that Jesus spoke of that is called an abundant life, a life that is full of the abundance of the very goodness, of the abundance of joy and peace, the abundance of love and grace, the abundance of forgiveness, the abundance of a great sense of calm, the abundance of freedom within our hearts and our lives. It's all awaiting for us. Sometimes we have a hard time seeing it, being able to view it. 
there are so many people who are stuck. They're stuck like this person. I'm going to share with you in this Bible story a blind man sitting by the roadside. We're stuck just like that, and we too are sitting on the roadsides of life. We're stuck because we're blind and we can't see the possibilities that lie ahead for us. For in this beautiful chapter of Luke chapter, eight, verse eight, chapter 18, it describes for us this wonderful story unfolding for us in a very metaphorical way, speaking to us today. It's not a story of what happened to Jesus. It's not a story of what happened in ancient times. Oh, it's there in that historical setting, but it's your story. It's my story. We're invited to put ourselves into the context of this story to see what it means for us here, now, in this very moment. For in this one chapter, chapter 18, it offers example after example of Jesus teaching through parables of the things of God. And so many people going, huh? What? Really? I don't see it. I don't get it. What's he talking about? That's true? Can't be. You see, there were so many who followed Jesus in a sense of wondering, a sense of lack of understanding. They followed for all kinds of reasons, and it wasn't the true intention of understanding the teaching that would enable them to see. A teaching that would tear off the blindness the barriers in their eyes to see from a true spiritual realm. Jesus spoke in a parable. As little children were coming to him, they were saying, no, 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 get those little kids away from Jesus. And Jesus said, wait, 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 let the children come. Do not understand, for in that sweet innocence, that is how we enter the kingdom of heaven. What? What's he talking about? In that same chapter, Jesus speaks in a parable. He's talking about a woman who is seeking justice, vengeance. I want some vengeance. I want this thing corrected, this thing that's coming out against me in my life. And going to the judge and saying, judge, you need to work the work of vengeance and revenge on this person. I demand justice. And Jesus speaking, do not understand that God is the God of justice and fairness We need not act out in retaliation or vengeance, for the Spirit of God will work all things in alignment. The spiritual laws of sowing and reaping will do the work. You need not be engaged. What? What's he talking about? Really? I can't see that. Then in the parable, he's also talking to a rich man who comes to Jesus and says, how can I inherit the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus explains, are you doing this spiritual work? Oh, yes, I am. Well, then sell all you have as the last effort and give to the poor. What? I can't see that. What are you talking about? That doesn't make sense. Jesus, what are you teaching? Over and over again, he offered these wonderful parables to describe the spiritual life and the journey. Not that we need to sell everything and be in poverty, but that we need to understand surrender. Not that we need to be people who are not uh, understanding that vengeance or, shall we say, What you sow, you reap will unfold because God takes care of that and we don't. Not that we don't need to, we can't understand the little children because we see them as beautiful examples. You see, all of this Jesus was trying to use as a message to convey. I want you to see clearly how you encounter God and his divine presence in its fullness. What God will do for you. And how that the Spirit of God unfolds in our lives as we simply surrender and move from the things of this physical earth to a sense of more heavenly consciousness. Jesus began to wonder about this. And let me paraphrase this. as Jesus saying, wow, when seekers begin to seek and inquiring minds to know, will there be anyone who has any kind of belief or faith? Will there be anyone who can see? Anyone who gets it? Anyone who understands. Because the Spirit of God is moving in powerful ways, but so many people are blind to it. And they're like a beggar sitting along the side of the road, and they can't see the possibilities of what's available for them, so they're looking to one another. Would you help me? Would you help me? Would you give to me? Because I don't see it for myself. I'm living in a sense of lack. I'm living in a sense of that I can't. I'm living in a sense of it's not possible. I'm living in a sense, and I'm so blind Blind to the fact that all around me is the goodness of God. So we find in this chapter a story unfolding for us. 
And it begins with a simple phrase, on the way to Jericho. That's the setting. Jesus and his disciples are traveling to Jericho. But there's something more. Why do we care where direction Jesus was going? Why do we care where he was traveling to? Oh, because the writer is conveying a deep nuance for us to get clearly and to understand. You see, Jericho signifies intellect or an external or a reflected state of awareness. Reflected. That's right. Reflecting. Okay? Kind of like the moon. Its light is supplied by the sun. A lot of people thought in ancient times that the moon had its own source of light, that the moon would come out and be brilliant at night from its own. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, the work of the moon is simply reflecting the light of the sun. Jericho symbolizes that in the intellect in our world of awareness where we are reflecting the light of God. Jesus and his disciples were on a way to this understanding. That's what the conveying message is. On the way to Jericho, which means an awareness that one day we might all wake up and realize we're here to reflect the light of God. Ah, oh, I see it now. I get it. I'm here to shine. I'm here to be a radiant light. I get it. I understand. I'm on the way to Jericho too. I'm on the way to understanding. I'm on the way to getting this. That my work here in this world is to reflect, to shine, to radiate, to be a light for the world, but to be a reflection of the divine within me, radiating out, shining out. So this story is our story too, for we're on this journey to spiritual understanding where we might get it, where we might have this aha, where we might see clearly with our own eyes and the blindness being taken away to be revealing the fact that we are people who are called of God to be a radiant beacon in this world and that there are infinite possibilities in doing just that. Now along this roadside, Jesus encounters this beggar, blind, blind who cannot see. And as this beggar is one who is not seeing the wonderful possibilities and not seeing the opportunities of what is found within himself, he's sending this sense of hopelessness. We serve a lot of people who are in the homeless community who have given up, who have a sense of hopelessness and they can't see the infinite possibilities that surround them. They think it's just so much easier to just resign to giving up rather than finding those ways of really engaging. Something has happened within their lives. Maybe it's medical, maybe it's physical, maybe it's mental, whatever it may be, but it's triggered a sense of hopelessness and they're blind to the possibilities. But before we become arrogant and thinking about homeless people, we have to apply it to ourselves because we've been there too. We've been blind to the infinite possibilities of God. We've stressed, haven't we? We've worried. We've allowed trouble to come into our lives and take root. We've engaged in fear because we've been blind to the very possibilities of God that are all around us simply waiting for the hand of God to provide, for the hand of God to heal, for the hand of God to bless, for the hand of God to do wondrous things. You see, what we're looking at is that there was suddenly for this man a moment of change. Something happened for this beggar who was blind along the side of the road. He begins to hear the commotion, and he begins to ask, who is this? Who is this? What's this noise coming? What is happening here? And what this symbolizes for us is the true awakening to sight to be able to see is to begin to be curious in our spiritual lives. Let me tell you this. One of the most important things that you could engage in is some spiritual curiosity. Curiosity that says, what's going on? Spiritual curiosity that says, I want to know more. Spiritual curiosity that says, tell me. I need to understand this. I'm curious. What does this mean? And how does this work? And what is faith all about? And how do we engage in a spiritual life of manifestations and transformation in our life? I want to be curious. He became a seeker. Who is this, he asked. Who is this? That seeker wanting to know is so crucial because quite often when we don't ask questions and we're not curious in our life, we become people who are simply led by blind faith, right? We're blind to it. A lot of people don't know why we do what we do when it comes to church or why we believe what we believe. There is 
an ancient gathering of, in India of those who gathered together to meditate. And the spiritual teacher began to gather everyone and said, let us sit down in the stillness and quiet and begin this time of meditation. And all of a sudden, a cat came running through, squealing and crying out and whining. And you know how a cat can be and disturbing all the meditation. And so the great guru says, you know what? You've got to lock that cat up. That's right. Just put that cat so we can have silence. Every day when they went to meditation, where's that cat? Where's that? Lock that cat up. Lock that cat up. Next day, where's that cat? Lock that cat up. Before they knew it, the guru says, before we begin meditation, we lock the cat up. And as years went by, they said, that cat died. We got another cat. And what do we do? We lock that cat up. Because you know what we do to prepare for meditation? The first thing you do is get your cat and lock him up. And like, do we know why we do what we do? You see, sometimes we're in a blind belief. We're blind. But we're believing. But what is it we're believing? I don't know if I believe. I don't even know what I believe. You see, then for centuries, as they gathered for meditation, time after time, year after year, moment after moment, the crucial thing was lock your cat up, and that became the teaching. You see how crazy we can be in our lives because we're not curious enough to ask questions and to seek and to search and say, who is this? What's going on here? I want to know. Spirit of God, what are you speaking about? What are you saying to me? How is this applying to my personal life? How might I grow? I want to know. I want to see. You see, the next thing that even happened within his life is that he began this curiosity that began to open the doors for a greater understanding within him. Sometimes we don't open the doors to greater understanding in our lives because we've practiced religion even before we knew anything about it. We went to church. We went to Sunday school. And we practiced religion before we knew anything about it. We didn't know why we did it. We just did it. Why do we sing? Why do we shake a tambourine? Why do we genuflect? Why do we bow? We don't really know why. We just, we just do it because that's what you do in church. Why do you pray? Why do you fold your hands? Why do you bow your head? Why do you look towards heaven? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? There are a lot of people who don't even know why they do what they do, but they just do it because it's what's done. So sometimes we are doing it, we're involved in it, and we don't even have the ability to analyze or to question or to ask where or how because we just grew up doing it, and we know why we do it. And what happens then in our lives that we've been practicing for so long that when someone begins to say, wait a minute, you don't need to lock your cat up at meditation. What? Of course we do. We've always locked our cat up. We know that that's what we do. Why do you lock your cat up? Well, because that's what we do. We begin meditation with locking the cat up and everyone, we've done it for years and we've always do it this way. And that's what we have to do. And well, why? You don't know. And so what happens when someone begins to question these things, your struggle, and what happens is we don't move into a phase of thinking and asking questions. We just simply say, oh, shut up. Blindly just follow. Lock your cat up. Come on. Just do it. Just do it. And so we become people of blind faith. We're never really, truly, truly seeing what's going on. Now, this blind beggar began with a sense of persistence. That's right. People said, shh, shh. Don't bother Jesus. Quiet down. Don't ask these questions. Don't be disturbing anything. Just be quiet here. But his persistence, it was continual. There was a consistency in his crying out that was just began to create this transformation in his life. Let me tell you this. It's not what you do occasionally that transforms your life. It's what you do consistently that transforms. People say, well, I prayed 20 years ago. Shouldn't my life be transformed? I went to church when I was a child. Shouldn't my life be transformed? I don't understand why the miraculous isn't unfolding for me on a day-to-day -day basis. I can't even see it because, you know what, I prayed six years ago. You know, see, it's what we do consistently with a persistence that transforms our life. So it is this beggar began to call with a persistency. I want to know. I want to know. Who is this person? And I'm not giving up. I'm calling out continually. And I want to see so much. Years ago, 
I had the opportunity of being in ministry in Africa, and I traveled from village to village, often arriving late at night, but gathering together with those who would come with their little lanterns and lights, and we'd sit under a big tree, and there I would offer teaching. People were hungry. They wanted to learn. They wanted to know of the things of God. So they had come together, and here was this teacher offering them some insight. And at the close of every service, it was dark. You know, in Africa, on the equator, at 7 o'clock at night, God pulls the shade down. That's right. There ain't no sunlight. Uh Uh-huh. It is dark, 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 dark in the night. And there's no city lights to reflect off the sky. In that darkness, you're trying to find your way home. And we were going back to the village from the center tree where we had gathered to create a little sanctuary for the teaching. Now we're traveling back to the village, and it's dark, and I can't even see the path in front of me. And I'm like, I can't see. Uh, where are you going? No, don't leave me here. You know, I, I can't even know where to go, where to walk, how to move. And the guide in front of me said, I said, can you see? He said, I can't see either. What are we going to do if we can't see? He said, oh, I do see. I don't see with my eye. But you see, down through the years, I've walked this path so many times. Consistently. Consistently. I see it now in my mind. I know the path. Walk on it. I see it because I've been consistent in the walk. That's so true of our own life. When we engage in some level of consistency within our life, we're going to experience some sort of transformation. And here we find this story being our story. When we are feeling like we're beggars and we can't see anything in this world of possibilities around us, we can't see the divine that's waiting for us, ready to unfold for us. It is that persistence that says, I'm calling out, I want to know. I want to understand. I want to see. That begins to open up our eyes that we may see the divine at work within our lives. Jesus then stops to speak with the blind man and asks, what do you wish me to do for you? Well, he offers in this moment the greatest wish of all time. I wish to see. I wish to see. The greatest wish of all of our lives, the greatest desire might be that we too are able to see the divine, to see God, to understand the possibilities, to see with eyes of great faith, to see the eyes of this wonderful spiritual world that we live in, to see with eyes that help us understand this infinite blessing and goodness that surrounds us. What happens when our eyes are open? What happens when we can truly see the divine? What happens when we truly have this spiritual awakening within our lives? What happens is we have the ability to see the unseen, the unseen. I want to tell you this right now. In this room, there are miracles awaiting you. Healing, prosperity, blessing, guidance, love, relationships. They're all waiting for you. They're right here, but sometimes we can't see them because we're looking through the physical eye. Wait a minute. I don't see the money of blessing. I don't see the health and wholeness within me. I don't see some sort of healing taking place where this wound is being healed right in front of me. I don't see, you see, we're constantly looking in the blind eye that's looking through the physical. And we're called to see the unseen in great faith. In great faith, I see the miraculous. In great faith, I see your healing. In great faith, I see the answer to your prayer already there. It begins there because my eyes are open. You know, you hear someone say, I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. What are they saying? I understand, right? I see what you mean. I begin to understand what you mean. I begin to get it. I begin to become awakened to it. And the Spirit of God is calling us out today to say, are you able to see? And are you able to respond, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. I understand that there is an expanded awareness of what is truly happening right here, right now, in this moment. Right now, in this room, in this present, in this moment, God is moving. The spirit of the miraculous is at work. Can you see it? It calls for you to see the unseen and to open your heart, to remove the blindedness from the eye, 
that calls you a beggar and makes you constantly look and want and say, I don't have, I don't have, I need, I need, because I don't have, I don't have. You already have. And you do need, don't need, because the Lord is your shepherd and you shall not want. Everything is there. It's already provided. So how beautiful it is when we understand this, that this is what happens to us. There is this great transformation. And Jesus speaks out to this blind beggar and grants that wish. And there is a beautiful healing experience that happens to him. And you know what happens what, when he has this wonderful experience? He went on vacation to Tahiti, and he forgot all of No, no, that isn't at all, was it? Well, oh, he decided, you know, he would spend time with family and friends, go on campouts and forget about church. Oh, well, no, no, that's not at all. Wait a minute, what is it? Oh, he followed Jesus immediately. No hesitation. There was no delay. There was no, well, maybe tomorrow or another time. Or there's a time when I'll think about spiritual life. Or you know what, down the road, I may, you know, uh, further sometime. But there was an immediate response, immediate transformation. Why was it so immediate? Because when you see, you get it. And it's amazing. It's wonderful. When you begin to see the move of God in this world, the hand of God moving, healing, touching, and ministering in wonderful ways, when you begin to see the love of God touching that wounded soul, that hurting heart, when you begin to experience the forgiveness of the divine, helping someone to experience full self-acceptance and insecurities leaving away and falling away from their lives, wow, you want to follow this immediately. You want to embrace this teaching immediately. Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. He didn't say, you know, someday I'll be about my father's business. He didn't say, further down the road, I'll be there. But I must. Right now, I must be about my father's business. I know you want to distract me. I know you want to pull me away from things. I know you want me to do. But right now, I must be about my father's business. And this is the example for us. That we wake up every morning and we say, I see. I must be about my father's business. I must be about the divine creator's work, the work of creating and manifesting and transforming a world. I must be about my father's business that's creating a world that works for everyone, not just a few. I must be about my father's business that is uh, blessing and touching and loving and healing and all this wonderful stuff. I must be about this, and I cannot wait, because when you see it, you live it, and you live it as if. That's right. You see it through the spiritual eye, but you begin to live as if, as if it's already here. Not wondering when, not wondering why, not wondering how, but now living as if. Because you see with an open eye the divine hand of God at work. Your eyes have been opened and you are no longer the beggar sitting by the roadside. You're the one who's gotten up and you start walking along the road and following Jesus. You're no longer complacent and sitting by and letting the world pass by. You've risen up because you see and immediately you begin to follow and go where the teaching may lead you and guide you. So today I want to tell you this. Right now we're on the road to Jericho. We're on the road to enlighten. We're on the road to understand. It. And on that road, we will one day see that we are this reflection of the divine to the rest of the world. And one day on that road, we will awaken and shed our beggar status of saying, I don't have, I need, I'm in lack. And understand with great eyes of faith, I possess, I am blessed. I have now. I walk in wholeness. I am healed. I am well. I am intelligent. I am gifted. We go on and on because we begin to see. So the Spirit is asking you today, what's your greatest wish? What's your greatest wish? I pray today that you express your greatest wish. I want to see. I want to see. Open my eyes to the spiritual Open my eyes to the divine. Open my eyes to the presence. 
open to my eyes the miraculous that is happening right here and now in this moment as God is speaking to us. Would you say with, the, with me, I open my eyes now. Say it. I open my eyes now. Let that be our wish. Amen. Thank you.